medical disclaimer. All the content shown on the Harry Sopanos channel is created for information purposes only, based on personal opinions of the host. The channel contains health and medical related material or discussions based on the best research science that I'm aware of and my personal interpretation and understanding of the past or current research literature and should not be viewed as medical advice. Any recommended dietary regime, supplement use or dosing is based on my personal usage and opinion and should not be viewed as medical advice or nutritional advice and is for information purposes only. If you're considering applying any of this information, first seek professional advice before doing so. None of the research information or opinions presented are meant as medical advice or to be used to diagnose yourself. Always seek medical advice from a physician or other qualified health provider. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor, go to an emergency department or call an ambulance immediately. The channel is not intended in any way as a diagnostic source for an acute condition. G'day guys. Um, this is a video on cancer. It's not going to be an in-depth science-based one. Um, that's the reason for the medical um, disclaimer. It will look at a bit of research, but it will be more focused on as a protocol, some steps, what to do, a bit of an insight um, when it comes to basically you know, what we know about cancer and stuff like that. I mean, our current knowledge is mixed. There's a lot of disagreements in the science community on the causes of cancer. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, different camps. There's a sort of Seafried model or the Werb Warburg effect type camp, which sort of promotes the idea that it's a mitochondrial metabolic dysfunction. That it is, um, but it's a bit more complicated than just that. And on the other side, you've got basically, um, you know, the medical establishment, which promotes the idea that cancer is a genetic disease. Um, now, while oncogenes are upregulated, um, you know, as we move into a sort of a cancer state, it's not it's you have to sort of wind back a bit and and determine what's actually causing that now you know the seafood model and uh, the sort of War warburg warburg effect is sort of focused on the that it's a mitochondrial disease and they have examples like where they will take you know you know healthy mitochondria replace the mitochondria um, of an unhealthy um, cancer cell and then you will not get replication you'll actually get cell division where the actual cells that are the that, that are derived um, are basically you know don't behave as cancerous even though their um, their nucleus um, still exhibits um, oncogene characteristics or, you know, damaged characteristics. Um, and then you've basically got the, the other side of the coin um, where they sort of actually have this attitude that, uh, well, you know, um, it's all these genes that are sort of, you know, there may be lifestyle factors, um, radiation, all sorts of things. And there's some truth in that, you know, damage to the to the cell, damage to the mitochondria from, you know, a number of things, bacteria, um, viruses can sometimes, you know, so there, there are a number of vectors for, for cancer in that regard. Um, the, the whole idea is, you know, arguing about that we, we sort of have to wind right back billions of years ago, you know, when there were sim simple cells, they were, they were immortal. You know they live forever um 
And the thing is, the reality is that those that those cells basically behave like cancer cells, you know, uncontrolled proliferation, and they were trying to basically, you know, dominate their environment. Now, when you try and do that, obviously, you know, it's a mad rush for resources, for energy resources. So cells from their outset, their prime motivation is to get as much energy as possible because energy means survival, energy means replication, energy means that they dominate an environment. And so it's really an energy issue. At the end of the day, whether it's, uh, you know, you know, metabolic disturbances, um, deuterium damage to the mitochondrial's capacity to generate sufficient energy through um, ATP synthase, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, it's an energy issue. There are energy sensing molecules within cells and they basically, once they realize that there is something wrong, you know, it doesn't matter what caused it, the, the cells themselves realize something is wrong. So what they do is they basically elongate um, the actual nucleus with these long chain 25 carbon, um, you know, fatty long chain fats and it's a protective mechanism. And then they basically um, protect themselves from, you know, upregulating through oncogenes, these glycolytic, these glycolytic processes. So, yeah, you know, you can, you can actually get damage where the cell has a deranged way of functioning, a deranged way of managing energy and uh, the cell realizes there's some risk. There is miscommunication. It no longer basically functions in a group of cells where it's communicating properly. And so, and also certain protective mechanism of apoptosis of eliminating these um, are not activated for a number of reasons. You know, obviously if you're, you've got a lot of, uh, um, derangement of your system, there'll be reasons why it's driving it. I think they're also immune system not functioning properly, which is a vitamin D deficiency. Um, it's endemic. If you look at the, the actual, if you go back in history, you look at early stages of people using seed oils and using, you know, you're getting cardiovascular disease, you're getting sort of disease we've had things like in the past, um, in the last hundred years, diabetes and even going right back to antiquity. But um, what we haven't seen is the cancer rates to this extent. You know, that's something we haven't noticed in the past. So we know that the immune system plays a big role. And if you look at PubMed, you'll see a shitloads of research covering, you know, vitamin D and cancer and its protectiveness. And I've already spoken about the, the protectiveness when it comes to enzymes in the prostate and enzymes and mechanisms inside breast tissue that basically can be controlled from proliferating. And that's due to vitamin D. And there are vitamin D receptors. And uh, you know, when it comes to cell um, proliferation and differentiation, vitamin D and, vit and retinol, vitamin A, and a, and, a, and an additional role with MK4 um, do play a big role in different tissues in different degrees, but they do play a role. And so there is quite clear that fat soluble vitamins are much lower in our diet currently compared to the past. And so the protectiveness of those fat soluble vitamins has also been eliminated. So there's a lot of factors that are actually interplay, at play that are basically creating this derangement in our body. So it's a multi-prong um, attack on the body and uh, this derangement that's happening with the body is causing a lot of this dysfunction. But fundamentally, you know, at the end of the day, when this energy derangement happens, 
and the cell um, starts sensing, you know, has miscommunications because of senescence. That means it's not functioning properly. And then it has a derangement in energy um, supply, which is, you know, due to basically um, a deuterium heavy diet, um, it can actually damage over time mitochondria. All the other factors that I've just mentioned can exacerbate the conditions and uh, make the system more vulnerable, a weaker immune system, um, a very high level of growth factors, IGF-1, mTOR and many others at excessive levels. I'm not talking about the levels that, you know, eating a steak keeps um, basically your levels of insulin to glucagon pretty low in that regard and one tempers the other at a more physiological natural level of 1.3 you know that's just slightly above the 0 0.8 that you would see with um with basically uh with fasting so you're not getting get an exaggerated but with the current form of diet that people are doing they are pushing up these growth factors quite a bit in a deranged environment and with a lot of other compromised immune systems and many other things in that sort of environment um, and signal problem problems with cells and the communication within the local type group where there is sort of control mechanisms that are that sort of start unwinding and uh, unraveling then the problem is that this can actually um, create the sort of environment where these arrangements then can move into where the cells for survival, they start behaving very independent in that regard. And so at this stage, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm sort of focusing more on what can you do, you know, once you get into this sort of state. We'll cover in future videos, you know, these specific areas in greater detail with diagrams and explaining how a lot of these mechanisms, how I believe some of these mechanisms are at play and looking at different aspects of drivers and elements. But I see it as a sort of a many, uh, energy management system and a sort of a derangement of the system and basically this miscommunication and then, um, you know, cells behaving in a very, um, you know, capricious, independent way, which they would have billions of years ago. And so, and there is not a strong immune system because generally people, people that are pretty much end up with cancer usually have a weak immune system, very unhealthy um, in a number of re regards to get to that sort of stage. You know, a lot of damaged mitochondrial, um, you know, so the, the actual level of energy production through ATP synthase has been compromised quite a bit um, in that regard. It doesn't mean that extra mitochondria are not functioning. They are, they are functioning below par. That means they're not functioning properly. And uh, there's some level of derangement, but there's gonna be parts, some mitochondria in there that are okay. So it's a mixed bag, but it's, it's the sensing that the cell it's the miscommunications and all that that are actually create those conditions. A weakened immune system that's actually not pushing the apoptosis or getting rid of these sort of, uh, you know, eliminating the organelles, which is the sort of the mitochondria and other parts within the cell that need to be cleaned up. And most people are basically pushing growth factors far too much. I've actually discussed in the past how in, you know, primitive, um, you know, single organisms and many other things billions of years ago um, when life first started on this planet. We're talking about organisms then that, that basically, you know, were very simple and, you know, IGF and insulin were one thing. It was basically called insulin IGF. You know, in more complex organisms, basically there's been a, a sort of a division of labour, you could call it. Um, to, but to, to use a simple, um, a simplistic term, terminology, it's a bit more complicated, but just to use for argument's sake. And, you know, 
mTOR is also driven. The degree that mTOR gets activated is not due to basically, um, you know, when it comes to, it's not, it's pretty much due to insulin. How high insulin IGF-1 go is what drives mTOR higher. So as you can see, if you're on a, you know, carnival diet, a steak only diet, your insulin is going to be much lower. Your IGF is going to be much lower. It's going to be tempered by glucagon. And so you're not going to get this over-exaggeration. You will still get enough, and with leucine, enough for muscle protein synthesis, but you're not going to be pushing massive growth factors. And at the end of the day, to really be pushing, creating an environment where you can actually have accelerated growth, um, you really need to basically have these things really high. And it's that you can only get it on a sad diet. And most people that basically succumb to cancer are pretty much have insulin resistance, uh, basically quite sick and deranged um, as organisms by the time this happens. So, you know, it's a sort of, you could say the end game um, for the sad dieter out there. Anyway, let's move on and look at some things that we can do and some stuff that we can use. Let me just share my second screen. Now, selenium. So selenium, whether it's uh, used. Now, I wasn't able to find the actual studies. There were actually, there was a Polish study done. I remember reading in a science in a business magazine when I was flying overseas. I haven't been able to find it. Um, that will be for a future date. I'll, I will have to try and track it down. But they were actually giving 250 micrograms of selenium. Um, this was in Poland. And they were able to reduce cancer by 46%. So it is a potent antioxidant, but also has a lot of other um, capacities in sort of reducing um, tumor growth um, and a number of other, you know, you know, sort of inhibiting migration of tumors has been noticed, a lot of things like that. So and that's important, especially to prevent metastatic or, um, you know, things from proliferating and other, and other tissues around the body. So it does have, it's quite potent in that regard. Obviously we have to be careful about not going too high with the toxic levels, even though that is, as I've spoken before, um, there are other factors at play as well um, that can uh, influence that like iodine status and many other things. So it's, it's not, you know, just basically the RDAs um, uh, are more narrow in their sort of the way they view this mineral. Um, but you know, on a carnival diet, you should be able to get anywhere between 100 and you know, 30, 140 odd, depending on how many eggs you consume as well. You can really very much get it up to, I usually get it up to about 200 per day, sometimes even higher. Now the US study actually showed, which was an earlier one, that this study referred at, I've never seen the US study, but the study, the Polish study did refer to it, that basically they had achieved with 200 micrograms about 42% reduction. So that's quite interesting, you know, that, that basically it does have a lot of that. And this is sort of, this is a review on all the literature. So I'll post that and anybody that's actually interested in going and looking at a lot of these um, uh, different studies, go to your heart's content. I will be looking at these studies at a future date. So if you, you know, if you're interested, you know, so endothelial cells, how it affects them, breast cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal, you know. So you, you name it, um, melanoma in particular for Australians. Um, fibrous um, uh, sarcoma and look at it and this is really important look at the pathways look at the MMPs MMPs, MMPs, MMPs 
how many times MMPs come up in a lot of these sort of areas. These are the collagen degrading enzymes. We know what regulates these collagen degrading enzymes. Vitamin D, retinol, MK4. Do I have to say it again? So good nutrition plays a big, big role in this sort of stuff. So lung cancer, other cancers, blah, blah, blah. So, and when we're looking at a whole lot of different other biological pathways, there we go. So, this is more information. This sort of these, a lot of these are human ones compared to some of the others that the other study referenced, which is important. So, selenium in vitro um, reduces MMP2 which MMP2 is a very much, you know, when it comes to melanomas, um, when it comes to a lot of tissues around the body, um, it is problematic. Um, depending on the tissue, again, vitamin D and retinol are the key players when it comes to MMP2, matrix metalloproteinases. So that collagen degrading enzyme is primarily influenced by those two um, vitamins, or to be more precise, a vitamin and a hormone, which is what vitamin D really is. And then pretty much, you know, these are, we're seeing different in, inhibition of migration. This is in breast cancer cells, you know. So all, all sort of the reductions in angiogenesis, you know, so all these sort of preventing these further growths and stuff like that in that regard. You know, the sort of things that we talk about vascularization and you know, so again here, MMP2. These are the two big ones, MMP2 and MMP9. And when it comes to when it comes to these two, they seem to be they seem to appear in many parts related to cancer. And it's always basically, you know, a vitamin, uh, a retinol deficiency and a vitamin D deficiency that really um, is important. And you actually see this amongst cancer patients. They usually basically are either both or one of them um, to a large degree. So it doesn't surprise me. That that's that that's the actual case with a lot of people. Now, when it comes to selenium, ah, oh, now selenium rich foods, Brazil nuts have far too much, and the problem is we don't know which soils they come from, so they can have very peculiar or ranges all over the place, from very little to massive amounts, which can really cause other issues with unbalancing iodine causing other levels of toxicity and problems like that. So they're a problem. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend Brazil nuts, let alone how much, nobody, I've never seen a real study that's actually shown exactly how much um, through Brazil nuts, how much you can actually really get. There is a lot of entering nutrients in Brazil nuts. So, you know, a lot of it's bound. So, you know, it's questionable how much and in what amount and depending on the soils where it comes on the planet. But when we look at this, basically it's not, ignore the percentages. That's just the RDIs, which is basically nutritional dickheads that came up with those numbers. Um, so basically, you know, 100 grams. So you can have yellowfin tuna. You can have 200 grams, it's like a nice big steak and get 200 micrograms, not very difficult on, a, on an animal based diet, you know, on a plant based diet, very difficult, unless you're going for Brazil nuts. And then there's a question of too much or the question of um, issues like um, bioavailability, which we haven't really seen good research um, in that area. So, you know, shellfish like oysters, they're just basically packed 
packed to the hilt, you know, 100 grams, you know, it's just packed to the hilt. Just a serving, three ounces will give you 238%. I mean, it's just, you know, you can basically just have a serving of, um, uh, of oysters and then basically forget about the rest of selenium in your diet for the, for, um, for the day, pretty much. Then we've got here, pork. So pork chops. So normally we carnivores have a good appetite when it comes to meat. So if you go for something like 400 grams, so that is about 14, 14, um, most of us are around about the six, 16 ounces in the US. Um, most carnivores easily would eat that um, in a day. 28.3, which is nearly pretty much half a kilo, 453 grams. Nice big steak. You know, a couple of chops will give you that very easily. You know, so divide that by 400, oh, sorry, wrong thing, Getting carried away there, divided by 100 times 47.4, you got 215. So, you know, there you have it. one meal, a whole lot of pork chops, and you've already got over 200. You don't need a supplement if you're on a carnival diet, you know, you just do not need to supplement. You know, you'll see what I mean as I'm going through this sort of stuff. You know, look at the difference. That's 47.4, you know, beef, you know, 30, 36. So let me do that. Well, that 47.4 times 36. So a nice big steak will give you 163. Very easy in that regard. Chicken is a bit lower, but not much lower. These are just fortified and it's pretty low anyway. 17.4 is not gonna give you much, you know, in that regard. That's bound, here later, forget it. You're not gonna get much out of that. That's just bullshit. Um, mushrooms get um, are pretty good bioavailable, so you will get from mushrooms. Um, but that's fungus; it's not even a plant. That's why uh, shrimps are pretty good as well, as you can see. You know, so you can basically have you know three hundred, um, four hundred, and you can pretty much get a nice big dose as well. Most of the most of them are basically animal foods. Now, foods high in selenium. So let me just take this across. I just want that figure for the for the actual. Yeah, we have a hundred. We go to the common. We don't want brands and all this other shit. Okay, so let's look at dairy and eggs. So hard boiled eggs, as you can see, you know, 30.8 plus three eggs. Um, and it's three eggs, uh, 24, so 90 plus. Point four. So there you go, three eggs and a big steak, and you've got plenty of selenium. Close to the Polish study. So it's not difficult to get. A lot of animal foods are pretty much very good when it comes to selenium. That's, sorry, that's six eggs. 
six eggs, so that's 100 grams. That's six eggs, yep, sorry, six eggs. We'll give you that. Five eggs, you know, you can have a bit of extra meat and cover that very easily. Another 100, pretty much easy. So, I wonder what that old geezer that did the 25 eggs a day times, uh, divide that by two, times that by 30.8, 385. It's probably getting a bit more from other few other foods. It's probably getting close to the 500, which is, you know, they call that the toxic going over that amount. But uh, you know, I mean, if you wanted to be even a vegetarian, if they really wanted to, eggs and and cheeses and stuff like that, they could basically do it. On a vegan diet, you'd struggle. But on a vegetarian diet, you'd very easily if you prioritised eggs and dairy products. So it's not beyond um, uh, the possibilities. This is a supplement. Uh, if people want to go down that core, that route, um, it's probably one of the least problematic ones. Um, it's derived from a, from a yeast source. Um, doesn't really have any problematic ingredients. Um, too much in that regard. But at the end of the day, it's not something I recommend. I think carnivores can get it through, through the diet. It's really for, you've got other, you've, let's say you've got family, friends that are basically not going to go fully carnivore and all that, may not be able to get enough in the diet. And so you'd recommend something like this, which is affordable and all that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, you should encourage them to eat um, animal products to get their source. The biggest problem is they're going to be fearful of mTOR. You, know, you sort of have to remind them that overactivation of these growth factors only happens when you engage the Randall cycle. That means when you eat sugar and fat together in large amounts. Um, but it's really hard to convince them to give up their carbs because a lot of these people, they're sick because they're carb addicted. That's the problem. Yeah, so yeah, that's the biggest problem in that regard. Okay, so this is another compound. It's called ursolic acid. It does affect a number of the mitochondrial pathways. And when it comes to the Warburg, Warburg effect, as well, they talk about that here and some of the effects in terms of the mitochondria. So, you know, metabolic signatures of cancer cell, not restricted to passive responses, damaged mitochondria, but resulting in oncogene directed metabolic reprogramming, which is required for support of anabolic growth. Exactly. That is why I always say it's an energy issue. So, yes, you've got to have some damaged mitochondria and suboptimal energy production, some derangement in signaling, and also, but I th ultimately, I think it's an energy thing of survival. Cells are driven for survival. Once they're not communicating and not being, you know, knocked out of the system because you've got a weak immune system, because you've got, you know, basically, you know, unhealthy lifestyle and diet, poor fat soluble vitamins and many other things like that that are actually pushing some of these factors. So, so here's again another study where they looked at brucilic acid, curcumin, and resveratrol. Now, when they actually looked at that, they actually noticed that when you combined either both the, these other two or just one of them with ursolic acid, you basically got the best responses in terms of this is in prostate, but uh, it does affect a number of these pathways. And so you can actually see the sort of effects that we actually get. 
So on its own. So here's resveratrol curcumin. It's about there. When you combine um, the that actual acid with curcumin, it actually seems to do better than actually even resveratrol. So in terms of tumor weight, it does bring the tumor weight down. So that's this the, seems to be the best combination. And because the problem with curcumin, um, which is what is actually in, it is a, a mineral chelator. It can cause anemia issues because it can bind to iron. So I would, if I was using this combination, I would be using this specifically um, in between meals. So, and you probably get a better result anyway. So at most, you could add a bit of fat to that. But that's all we're gonna look in terms of science, just to get you get an idea in that regard. So, This is small work that I'm looking at, um, acylic acid inhibition of growth of colon, colon cancer, initiating cells by targeting STAT3, which is really important. There's a, a number of things that actually do target that, you know, um, resveratrol has a bit of an effect, um, uh, quercetin also, there's a whole lot of things that actually affect um, this pathway. So it's a basically a signaling pathway, but it's quite interesting in that regard. So there are enzymatic pathways that I've actually looked at in that regard. Um, and this is in regards to some stem cell research that I'm doing on the side um, of my own. Um, that's for a later date, but uh, it's quite interesting how it interacts with this pathway. Basically, it does induce interleukin-6, which is another inflammatory sort of pathway, like all this sort of stuff. Anyway, reverses. This is another really imp important thing about ericelic acid. I know a lot of your relatives are probably going to go down the, unfortunately, the let me poison my body pathway of the modern um, medical system. This also has a reverse chemo resistance. So what it does, what acetyl acid can do is actually be slightly protective. So it can actually improve the sort of targeting. It can actually improve the sort of, you know, you know, kill the right thing and not, you know, do too much damage to the body. So it does have some benefits in that regard. And also it has another effect, which is, this is another you know, reason why chemotherapeutic drugs and a lot of these sort of things in the end fail, they just don't work. Because you get multi-drug resistance, basically. This is another advantage of this basically um, ursulic acid, which basically even oncologists should be basically using it. I don't know why they're not using it. They should be supplementing it because it actually has the ability to reverse multi-drug resistance, you know, to the, to the therapy that they recommend, to the chemotherapy that they recommend. So um, I'm, yeah, there's so much re research out there and I'm staggered that it hasn't filtered the oncology sort of uh, community to understand the importance of this supplement. You know, so it's one of those things that, you know, takes time to filter through um, these sort of organizations. But yes, so that's, that's that one there. Um, this is the only product that I've come across that's, it's not an injectable. Um, now, obviously they're pushing it because it does have some effects because of improving insulin sensitivity and stuff like that. So there's a lot of improvements there. So it supports fat loss, lean muscle, uh, you know, cardiovascular health, obviously because you're dealing with some of that inappropriate foods. 
So, uh, doesn't have really anything really too problematic. Um, but then at the end of the day, you know what? Um, these are in trace mineral form, so they're not going to be a real a real big problem when you're fighting um, with cancer. I think you're going to be less interested about some of that some of those details. So rosemary leaf extract. So rosemary leaf extract does have this. So you know me, I do use rosemary as a as a herb. And I see it as a protective herb that I use in my cooking. Uh, my father uses it heavily and he grows his own, which I do get some rosemary from him um, now and then. So it's one of my favourite things to use with liver as well, to change, to improve the profile, the smell profile and all that. Um, you can put it in the cucurezzi, you know, combining all the different organ meats and all that, which I've explained in the past that's not for this so yep so this is that product and this is a product of resveratrol um just so you guys are aware you know, in that regard that you can combine the two um so if you don't want to go that down the curmin way in that regard um it's up to you i mean I'm not really a big fan of resveratrol anyway. Um, I've used it in the past, but uh, the problem with a lot of these compounds, if you're going to use resveratrol, you're going to use curcumin, make sure it's not with a lot of food or without food or in between meals. And the reason for that is um, also the chelating effects on micronutrients, especially minerals. And I find that, that, that that's can create problems of overuse. So, you know, the average person should not basically be looking at this um, in that regard. Now, this is another area that is important. Senescent cells. So it's great to basically, you know, to fast to basically now just another point on fasting if you're in the early stages of cancer fasting can be really good for apoptosis getting rid of the junk you know reducing the damaged cells or stuff like that problem is if it goes metastatic fasting can actually be used as a protective mechanism by cancer cells to protect themselves so after that cut back you know eliminate the fasting basically um, time restricted feeding is fine. Fasting is, you know, really when you get over 24 hours. So you shouldn't be doing it if you've got cancer. Time restricted feeding is fine because that will that will lower the insulin as long as you, you know. So just to differentiate those two points. Now, senolytic agents can induce cell death. That means they can force senescent cells, damaged cells, to die okay that's a good thing if we can eliminate some of this old garbage and all that we can basically reduce our vulnerability so th this is a, a compound that i sort of recommend to anyone you know um i would say with a product like cerule you know that um Bart sort of um promotes combination with this with something like this you basically got the best of both worlds you're basically eliminating the damaged cells out of that and promoting new cells. Obviously, you you know, if you don't want to go down the cerule pathway, you can always go down the pathway of fasting, um, you know, things like uh, also that promote, that help in, in that uh, things um, like exercise, fasting, um, things that increase NAD, which is basically niacin and uh, they will push the sirtuin pathways and all that. So all these sort of pathways do help as well. Um, there are, you know, I will go into a separate thing about 
um, stem cells. Stem cells can be a double-edged sword when you've got cancer because, you know, overexpression can actually be hijacked by cancer. So you've got to be really careful there. So for cancer purposes, I would not supplement. Um, for everyone else who doesn't have cancer, it's a good idea. It'll actually be more protective of the potential of having. It's like the fasting. Fasting is great when you don't have cancer or you're in the early stages, but at the later stages, it can be protective or can be hijacked. Problem is once your cancer gets going, the problem is it can hijack anything. It can hijack, it can use ketones, it can use fatty, fatty acids, it can use everything, glucose, lactate, you, you name it. It's worked out a strategy of how to use it. So um, you, you really need to starve it in that regard and, and stress it to, be, to basically get rid of it. Um, and that's where you know, a ketogenic diet is really good because a ketogenic diet actually will stress cancer cells, you know, and if you improve your immune status and stuff like that, vitamin D, vitamin A, all the fats on your vitamins and stuff like that, you're giving your body a more of a, a chance. The other thing is you want to reduce the damaged cells in your body. And that's where basically um, these senolytic senile, agents really work well. Now, which is the best? Oh, that's important. Now, there's a lot of different synolytic agents, but we don't want to be wasting too much money on things that just work a bit. You know, we really want to get the biggest bang for our bucks. And the biggest bang for our bucks is this one here. Um, let me just pronounce that properly. Fisetine. Fisetine is the daddy of all basically um, senescent killers. You know, the, the one that actually gets rid of senescent cells the most. Okay, so it is a flavonoid. And uh, administration of um, fisetin to wild type mice later in life restored tissue homeostasis, reduced age related pathology and extended um, medium and maximum lifespan. So they've actually seen great results compared to all other um, synolytic type. And also senescence, sen you know, we're talking about is a tumor. Remember what I said is a tumor suppressor mechanism activated in stress cells to prevent replication of damaged DNA. Remember what I talked about the CD38? Now you understand that some of the stem cell sort of stuff can have an effect on that pathway. That is why when I said that CD38 is a protective mechanism and increases all the crackpots out there say, oh, we need to suppress CD38. No, you don't. That's the last thing you want to do. It is a protective thing to prevent senescent cells from becoming cancerous cells, okay? That's what it is. That's why it increases with age because you've got more damage. It's the old thing that Ron Rosdale used to say, even though I sort of do disagree with him on the mTOR issue, which I've discussed earlier, but he's right about one thing. It's a fight between damage and repair and damage wins in the end. Now, with this supplement, we can basically give ourselves a bit of a chance in order to reduce the amount of senescent cells in our body. Let's knock them off, you know, fasting, exercise, and something like this. When you use something like this and you knock off the senescent cells, what are you going to do? Your CD38 is going to come naturally down. You don't have to suppress it. All these crackpots out there are trying to push suppressing and what they're going to do is they're going to put a lot of people at risk of cancer anyway that's a different thing because a lot of people you know that are taking these supplements are on a sad diet they've got a sad diet it's actually increasing this sort of vulnerability and then you're basically suppressing the internal mechanism that protects you that's why these crack pots that recommend high doses of these nad boosters which have a suppressive effect on cd38 
are putting people at risk long term. So you've got to be very careful about these things, guys. Now, this is the supplement. This is one of the better ones. And most of the other ones do not have the sort of amount. You know? So this one has 100 milligrams, where a lot of the other ones tend to be... Mm, so, Phycetin is a bioflavonoid antioxidant that can help maintain glutathione levels and mitochondrial function in the presence of oxidative stress. Got it? Which is really good for the mitochondria as well. It has the potential to cross the blood-brain blood barrier, which may help maintain neural functions. So it's got a lot of effects all over the body in that regard. But our sort of interest is, as the study says, our interest is in the, basically the killing off, the inducing cell, induced cell death in senescent cells. That's where our focus is on, you know, and should be on that sort of stuff. Anyway, now let me just find the other part. And I'll just stop sharing for a moment. So, yeah. That's that study. Uh, yep. Okay. This is the other part that I want to look at. Okay. That's at the point. So let me just share this. This is a Hungarian researcher. This is a Oops. Stop. I forgot to. When sharing, share with audio. Okay, share. Uh, a physical salt solution with a 25 ppm deuterium. And we had, have an equipment which is a needle free injection. It means that we can push the ph physical salt solution uh, into the intracellular space by using a high pressure. So, what they're using there is. Um, you know, orally, you can actually consume deuterium depleted water. So you can buy it, drink it, and sort of deplete um, the deuterium that's actually damaging the mitochondrial capacity to generate energy. So we know that that's the, that's the metabolic side of the actual cause or, or the component that's actually reducing the energy production in the actual, you know, by damaging the mitochondrial electron chains. So, and deuterium, what it does is, you know, what it, the effect that deuterium has is to displace and clear out and lower the deuterium levels in the cells. So the more you consume this deuterium depleted water, the more you will change that, the level of deuterium inside, which basically means that you will have much cleaner metabolic water, which also basically means that you will basically be able to reverse some of the deleterious effects of high deuterium. That means that once your melatonin starts repairing the actual, um, and that's the other another thing important, get you sort out your sleep if you've got cancer, um, maybe for a short period of time, take a small dose of melatonin. We don't want to down-regulate the capacity for the body to, to do that, but a small dose to help repair, but you've got to get off the shit as well um, and then transition and get blue blocking glasses, all that sort of stuff, which I've talked about before to improve circadian rhythms. Um, that's not something that I'm going to cover in this video, but people know about it. Um, you can check my videos in regards to that, my live streams that I talk about it. I will be making a 
future video on specifically circadian rhythms and certain products that you can use to improve your environment in that regard. But at this stage, I will focus on just what I've discussed and the metabolic water. So let's just see the effects. Now, they are actually using high pressure injections straight into the area where the cancer is. Okay, so the effects that they're actually seeing in these dogs, these animals are basically from that. So let's be quite clear about that. You're not going to get the same effects because when you basically drink the water, it's going to be diluted all over the body. It's not going to go to those specific areas. Okay, so the, the results that they're getting, these rapid results are because they're going straight for those areas. So just let me make that quite clear. And no... A couple of slides you will see how effective can be the deuterium depletion. This is a breast cancer uh, without treatment before our, the treatment with DDW and you can see the tumor is growing down and infiltrate the, the area and we applied the DDW locally we could see that, that the tumor was uh, rejected from the body and the tumor was sitting on a stalk after five weeks. This is a control animals. These animals had a breast cancer. The breast cancer started to grow and after... So you can see it down here. That's what it looks like. He's holding it in his hand. Where the actual sitting on that... What is it? Looks like a... Is it a tissue or is it a small... Yeah, who knows? Anyway, unimportant. But you can see it's quite substantial. After a couple of weeks, these animals died. That dog wasn't treated with so that dog did just died because they didn't treat it so deuterium depleted water so this is a normal way how a tumor develop and and kill the animal that's how they normal now i don't think that's normal even for dogs but today's owners feed their dogs kibble so what do they expect they make them sick. This series, another tumor, the tumor is on the, uh, uh, on the eyelid of the dog. Here you can see also there is some stalk and the tumor is, is uh, coming out from the body and uh, it can increase the operability and it's very easy to remove the rest of the tumor. The next uh, sl slide shows another tumor on the uh, aurica of the animal. Here's a tumor, four weeks treatment, eight weeks treatment, 16 weeks, uh, 24 weeks treatment. There is a huge regression. And I can show you again a contra animals which hadn't been treated with deuterium depleted water. So the tumor destroyed the whole uh, part of this uh, aurica. Another example, again, rectum tumor, the size was so big, locally injected, causing a, a big decrease in deconcentration there was a gradual decrease in the tumor size. And this is my favorite. That dog was uh, uh, diagnosed with hemangus sarcoma on the neck, and that dog received the chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and that time they wanted to kill the animal, saying, okay, this is the end of the story. So we could get the animals, and Marian started the treatment. Here you can see that the necrotized part of the tumor disappeared. And 10 weeks later, there is a good regress big recession. And 14 weeks later, even regressed. And later, the tumor completely gone. So finally. Yeah, so you can see basically it's pretty much cleared. That's a scar tissue. There's no tumor there. It's gone. You know? And this is the sort of really important thing that sometimes people just don't understand. We're talking about it's gone you know it's not basically just sitting around or whatever it's gone and it's a very effective thing to basically and it's what i've been saying in the past remember when there was an argument between some people that were being a bit critical towards bart and saying oh you know um, Bart doesn't know what he's saying it's a Warburg effect that seafried is right and you know because bart was saying no 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 in order to, uh, to you know there may be metabolic disease and all that but at the end of the day you still need to activate oncogenes to basically get the cancer going to to switch what it's doing 
we're not arguing that it's a genetic disease here. We're arguing that, um, you know, me and Bart are arguing that it is the genes that drive the cancer. It's because it senses as a cell for survival that basically I'm not getting enough energy. Now, that may be due to mitochondrial damage, you know, a number of things that are causing this problem, miscommunication, viruses, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the cell is sensing something isn't right and it can't communicate with surrounding cells and then it sort of is in a deranged state and it will basically initiate protective mechanisms for, for survival and it will initiate oncogene activation. Before that, it actually does that. It will elongate it you know, these long chain fats to protect itself, to protect the nucleus, you know. But when you actually use this sort of therapy of metabolic water directly into that area, what you're doing is you're displacing and clearing out a lot of the deuterium. So with melatonin repairing the electron chains, you can actually reinitiate some of the production of energy. Once the cell realizes, oh, we've got energy coming in, we don't need to use these other mechanisms, which are much, which are very dangerous for the nucleus and all that. And once, you know, it won't actually cut off, you know, all glycolysis, but it will basically transition from glycolysis, um, you know, from being very glycolytic, again, to be oxidative phosphorylation type related. So as you restore, and this is what the, this is what the deuterium water does. It's cleaning up, reducing, um, getting rid of the deuterium inside the mitochondria, which means that then what is being pumped through the proton, through the pumps, the, the complexes for the proton gradients in the inner mitochondrial um, membrane area, that will be, you know, full of protons without any deuterium. And the melatonin will actually fix and repair over time the ATP synthase, the complex five, and it means that then it can restore energy production in terms of ox oxidative phosphorylation and reverse. Now, obviously, this cell was still going to be damaged and senescent, so it's not going to be a healthy cell, but it basically can revert back. And then the body, through good nutrition, good vitamin status, blah, 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 will slowly clear out these old damaged cells what it's supposed to do, but because we derange our systems, it doesn't happen as it should happen, as it used to happen on an ancestral species appropriate diet. So as you can see, it's a complex picture. You know, you know we understand how important, you know, deuterium is. We understand how important light is as well, because light plays a big role, earthing yourself to basically repair things. All these things are important. So it's a combination of what you stick in your mouth and all these other um, environmental factors and interactions that we have as a species. That is important. Anyway, now let's continue this. I know these animals are still alive after two or three years after the treatment. You hear what he said? still alive after two or three years of the treatment. So it's a very effective treatment. It actually, so the, the problem is that the currently as um, Laszlo Boris is still fighting with the FDA to try and get this to be used um, on humans, this type of therapy. You can buy the metabolic water, but it's, it's not as effective. You know, at the end of the day, adding a lot of fat and getting rid of sugar will produce a lot of metabolic water, good quality metabolic water without having to fork out an arm and a leg. That's why the a ketogenic diet has such positive effects on cancer. It's not because the ketogenic diet necessarily per se, it's because it tends to be higher in low deuterium you know, sources. That's the thing you're basically getting more metabolic water from fat, from animal fats. And it depends, not all ketogenic diets are the same. Some ketogenic diets have shown not to work. And we know the sort of types that we're talking about. We're talking about the type of therapeutic ones that they've used um, in the past for 
conditions like, and this is where all the studies are out there saying, oh, ketogenic diets do not work with a number of cancers. And when you look at the, some of these ketogenic diets, how are they designed? A lot of them have got seed oils. And we know seed oils are very high in deuterium, 255 parts per million. You know, double that nearly of sugar. So they're not using animal products. And a lot of the actual early research from the John Hopkins University Hospital, where they used a lot of, for epilepsy and all that, a lot of it was seed oils as well. There's a lot of seed oils involved in that regard. Um, so that's the issue. A lot of those studies are tainted with plant-based oils. Um, their main primary source of fat. So there's the deuterium angle, which is completely being missed. An actual ancestral ketogenic diet is basically one based on animal foods, not based on something coming out of a industrial oil refinery. Okay, that's unnatural. That's not an actual um, animal-based food or low carbohydrate food that you would find in nature. In nature, you would find seasonal sugar and you would find animal, the flesh of animals and their fat, their associated fat. So, but unfortunately nowadays we can produce anything within our factories, any sort of garbage, which we can call keto. And most of the keto bars and keto products and all this sort of nonsensical food is highly processed and will tend to be higher in deuterium when you process things like, um, you know, protein powders and all that sort of stuff, you increase the deuterium content. So a lot of these protein powders, their deuterium content can sometimes be even higher than that of, you know, a tuber. Yes. A starchy tuber can have lower deuterium levels than some of these protein powders. Exactly. You know, say no more. This is why people just don't know what they're eating and why they're eating. So it's why I promote animal foods for bodybuilders, traditional, you know, steak and eggs. Ah, yes. And uh, some dairy products, if you can tolerate them and seafood. Let's not forget the seafood as well. This is a rectal tumor. The tumor disappeared. And here I only would like to show what we have done with the other animals also. So we took the samples regularly after a couple of weeks of treatment and we asked the pathology to, to analyze on cell level. So before we started the treatment, the pathologist says this is an adenocarcinoma. After four weeks, uh, it was said it's an apocrine adenoma, which means there was a shift from malignus to benignus. And after eight weeks, uh, no tumor cells were, were uh, uh, found. That was a heavy lymphoid infiltration, which is part of this curing process, as the immune system goes, th goes there and, and eliminate the necrotized cells. Okay. So sharing that. Hey, listen, I don't have a lot of time. Let me get rid of that. And just bear with me for a sec. Now. Yeah. Now, the Hungarian company is called Preventa. So they produce this, um, it's a veterinary thing called um, DDW25. Now, the only problem with this, it's not, it's not graded for humans. So I will leave you to ponder that. You don't need to you don't need to buy that you can actually go to their regular products which is these ones here which is their water products now different currency us or euro so i'll just use us for the moment 
Now, they do have distribution around the world, so you can look at other distribution partners as well on here and contact them as well. So, Preventer USA, China, Slovakia as well, the Netherlands, the UK, and even Panama. Well, there you go. There are rich Americans that are living in Panama, so I suspect that's why they're focusing on that part of the world as well. Anyway, let's do that. But they will, there are companies also that do sell in other parts of the world. Now, just go into the product. So this is the sort of product we're looking at. So you get it, you know, as a pack. Um, so each bottle of 125 is $5.61. And the more deuterium depleted it is, the more expensive. So you can see it becomes very expensive. One bottle, $28 for one bottle. It's extremely expensive. That's the problem. Um, there are other options. There are people that are basically say, well, you can buy one of this and combine it in that regard. Um, this is one of Jack Cruz's forums and this guy actually gets the 25 ppm and then combines it with tap water to dilute it down to about 108 or 101 in that regard. So you can do, you've got that option as well. They can combine it. So that's tap water and that's, um, uh, RO, I'm not sure what RO is. It's, uh, must be some sort of uh, other type of water somewhere up here. Not sure. Anyway, if you know, you know, if you don't, um, Google it. So basically, these are sort of options that people can do and all that. That's the pretty, the UK one, which we saw in that list. I think this, this is the Australian one. As you can see, it is very expensive. You can go for, remember, at the end of the day, you want to be between 100 and 130. But if you've got cancer, you want to be at the lower part. You don't want to be too low. And that's where, you know, these ones, unless you can actually get them injected directly in, um, in these lower levels, and it's not goes else everywhere, I find that it can be a problem and the body can get into a state where you've got too, too low deuterium and that can actually cause other issues as well, which I don't want to go into at the moment. Um, there are biological um, reasons why, and even Laszlo doesn't recommend it either. He basically recommends people use, you know, one of the either dilutes, like that guy recommends or goes no lower than 85 parts per million. So with the food and all that, it'll probably, it'll, it'll mean it'll average out to about a hundred, which is a nice area to be. Um, it's not potentially cause it going to cause any problems with, with your health. Um, and the thing is, the other thing that Leslie also believes is that if you were to, that, that if you go down there and you've still got, a number of cells that haven't been cleared out of the system and potentially revert whatever, you may not have the leeway to deal with much, you know, that it may start using other mechanisms, uh, you know, it's out, out for survival to suppress certain things in order to basically maintain itself. So for survival purposes. So, he doesn't recommend, I sort of agree that um, it's uncharted um, territory, unless you can get it directly injectable um, as 20, as Preventer 25 into the actual site where the cancer is. If it's visible and all that, if it's internally, you look at 80, um, either 25 in a diluted form um, or 85 as something you consume. Now that's quite expensive still, it's about nearly 
you know, nearly 12 bucks a bottle. So it's not cheap in that regard. This brand seems to be a bit, you know, a bit cheaper in that regard. So, you know, so that's another, another option um, for people. Um, I will do a video eventually. I'm, uh, I haven't done a lot of the research currently on the injectable protocols. So, and I've sort of seen some information, but I'm not really happy with it. So I don't want to basically be saying to people, well, you know, do this when I'm not confident enough that people can, can't or not that. The other problem is with some of this sort of stuff, um, you got to know what you're doing um, and you really need a, a physician to supervise this. So you need to find, you know, a physician that knows what they're doing and can actually apply this protocol. Currently in the US, the FDA will not approve this procedure. And the in the European Union only for dogs and cats and stuff like that is this procedure approved currently. So it's a crazy world where we live in where dogs and cats can be injected with um, a DDW25, but humans can't. So what do you say? It's just a weird and a wacky world in that regard. So I'm just going to stop that so to be able to find the other part that I just want to provide. Okay. As I've said in the past, you know, herbs and spices and certain certain sources from plants uh, basically have medicinal purposes and that's how we should see it not as food but as medicinal things now these are sort of 10 um 10 foods that can block um uh, the glutaminase which is the you know the sort of uh, glutaminase is an enzyme that gen that generates glutamate from glutamine so you've probably heard big issue um, in cancer research. Even if you put somebody on a ketogenic diet, you eliminate, entirely you eliminate the, um, the sugar component, it can still use glutamate um, to basically, so from glutamine, which you still need, the body still needs, but so to remove that, you're gonna have problems with collagen tissue and stuff like that. That's where all those MMPs come in. So you have to think it in, in two ways. One, you want to limit that conversion. Two, you want the MMPs being regulated properly by the fat-soluble vitamins. So it's a two-pronged thing. You probably haven't heard this by others because people don't think laterally, unfortunately. They're all into reductionist nonsense. But we need to cover all facets when we're looking at this sort of stuff. Now... When we're looking at this sort of areas, these are the sort of sources that these things come from in that regard. Um, again, ursulic acid is also a strong inhibitor, much stronger than some of the other stuff in that regard. So forophane has a lot of issues with it. I'll give that a miss. Um, valerian, you know, ashwagandha, yeah, it has some some effects I've used it in the past for other other reasons um, in that regard, especially with suppressing estrogen and stuff like that. And estrogen is a factor, so I sort of um, you know can be an issue. Um, you know, part of that milieu of growth factors and uh, and derangement. So it's an option to throw in there. Um, graviola, you know, probably. Not really. A magnolia bark extract, I wouldn't bother. Um, liposine, yeah, well, it's has really a, a very little effect, very low 
uh, cumin is more the combination with oh, silic acid to knock out you know senescent cells um, egcg has multiple pathway effects but also can have chelative can have other negative side effects so you can have a bit but keep it outside food don't combine it with food um, and uh, you know now and then just keep in mind i still think that ursulic acid together with either resveratrol if you're having food or cumin um, is the better way to go um, this has you know you'll find it in basil and pistachio nuts um, in that regard obviously in these sort of foods you won't get find the concentrations we need so go for the supplement that i've talked about um, and pretty much that is it uh, a lot of these things you know sulforaphane can be a real problem with in a number of other ways i don't recommend it um, it sort of seems like more has other hormetic effects and all that and i'm not convinced as much a lot of this is associational in that regard where acylic acid is there is actual you know good mechanistic stuff so i'm more confident with this and curumin combination resveratrol combination where the others are more associational in nature and where ashwagandha is probably something which um, helps with the estrogenic side some people that have certain cancers can have quite a bit high estrogen levels this can help um, bring them back to base the other thing is boron which i've talked about before that can also bring a lot of the hormonal stuff back to base as well so consider that you know what i mean 12 9 6 3 stick to 3 being the safe zone so you're still going to get the benefits so that sort of covers sort of um, you know some of the things that I would do if I had cancer or um, you know and I was fighting with that sort of side of things I'd basically eliminate all high deuterium foods and I mean all high deuterium foods and basically focus on a more you know the protein levels I'd stick to is probably lower than I would do right now I'd lower it down to about 20 percent and up my but still i'm not fearful of protein as long as i'm in a ketotic state my fat is high and my um, insulin to glucagon ratio is at that lower more ancestral level of, i do not worry at the end of the day you need the more fat in order to get the, the higher metabolic water with that uh, without having to pay an arm and a leg for it um, in that regard so we need to inhibit glutamate and we need to inhibit glucose and we need to provide more metabolic water this combination of the three prong combinations you can do it with natural foods in that regard supplemental can accelerate that probably the acylic acid is the one that i will really if I'm going to supplement anything, that would be the one that I would really want to supplement. You know, so even if a cell reverts back to a senescent state, I want to get rid of it. It's damaged. It's still got basically some derangement inside the nucleus that, you know, potentially could switch it back. You want to get rid of that garbage um, out. So that's the one that I would definitely focus on um, in that regard so i hope this was informative in terms of protocols i will be doing more videos in the future when it comes to cancer and i will be doing i will be focusing on the different aspects so it'll be you know circadian it'll be basically deuterium it'll be basically different nutraceuticals i've sort of covered them in general now as a general sort of protocol of things to do you know, to action um, in that regard. At the end of the day, you know, do take this to your physician. Um, and uh, this is not medical advice. Let me make it quite clear. This is what I would do if I found myself in this sort of condition. What you do is up to you, it's your body. And you should always seek um, advice from your own physicians that 
uh, dealing with your um, case. If you don't and you want to consider this as an option, um, that is up to you at your own risk. I do not take any responsibility. This is what I would do. You know, so what you do with this information, I've shown you the information, I've shown you some of the, the research that I'm basing my thinking and why I would approach things this way. Um, since the current medical system doesn't really have any solutions other than basically poisoning you with a lot of uh, radiation and chemotherapeutic drugs. Um, at least if you do go down that course at a minimum, do consider um, oxalic acid, which is really important and can be very helpful. And some of the other protective going to ketosis as well. Um, if you go down that pathway is very helpful using some of these glutamate inhibitors will give you a better fighting chance. So even if you've got a, a relative that's not going to do a lot of these things, at least if you can get them to make some dietary changes and use some of these things that can inhibit some of these um, things that help um, the cancer with its, you know, growth is better than nothing. Um, and also to prevent multi-resistance, um, drug resistance as well. Silic acid is going to be really good in that regard as well. So these are options. These are things to consider. These are things to discuss with your physician. Take some of this research that I've shown you. I will put links. Take it to your physician. Show them. Say, look, look what this says. You know, please read it. I want to incorporate some of these things in and try and work with them if you can. Sometimes some of them may be willing, maybe more than interested. If they're basically too closed mind, consider a different physician. You've got the right, it's your body after all. It's not for me to tell you what to do. It's not for anyone to tell you what to do. It's your body. At the end of the day, you need to take responsibility for your body. This is what I would do, but you need to basically action appropriately and uh, Consider what I've discussed, discuss it with others, discuss it with a physician um, and look at your options if you're basically you know, fighting an active cancer in particular. Um, I hope this was informative and gave you a bit of an insight in my thinking about what the literature really says and understanding of, um, uh, you know, a sort of a general understanding of cancer um, better than probably some other people have elaborated and some of the options you've got. So anyway, take care and uh, good night. See you.